This talk uh, will be called Discovering Orc Topologies, and I'm going to share my screen now. And by discovering Orc Topologies, you should be able to see my slide then, right? Yeah, it works. Yeah. We mean, well, uh, first of all, we will let you discover it today uh, if you haven't um, yet met this idea of Orc Topologies. And we also share our idea of discovering that. Because as we say with Roland, we are not, we have not invented or created Orc Topologies. We have discovered that. So it's more like the, you know, the chemical table of elements where you need to discover that the elements, but the table is just the way you arrange those elements. So the orc topologies essentially is this map or a table or a mapping um, that has these 16 archetypes that we figure out is enough to describe in much more details an agile ecosystem. So today you will discover orc topologies with us and you'll be able to use it. It's a tool for uh, change agents uh, to help create thoughtful organizational development or a thoughtful org design. By change agents, we mean people who work internally as agile coaches, scrum masters uh, within companies uh, with a mandate to change, maybe di even directors, owners of the company, and also for people who work as, as consultants who help um, you know different companies shape their change. So this is essentially a tool, a, a framework agnostic tool, but we're going to talk about the frameworks today too, uh, that might help you um, might help you to get your job done better at shaping the change or whatever that change is in an organization. Uh, yeah, and even yeah. if you're maybe maybe it doesn't apply to you, and maybe you're not a change agent per se, you don't have it on your name card. It still might be um, very useful to understand better by using maybe uh, the org topology map in your situation that you're in to identify what kind of ecosystem you're a part of and why it is so slow or why it is not moving the way you would like it to be moving. So um, it, it can just help you to understand where you live inside your organization to try to, um, you know, to, to create a product and deliver it in the hands of the customer. Yeah, so we've been developing this for quite some time. We have a pretty much act active Slack community you can join from their website. Yep. It's a few words about us. We are both uh, Scrum trainers. Roland is with Scrum Org. I'm with Scrum Alliance. So as we typically say, we pray to the same gods, but we just go to different churches. So we are Scrum biased and team biased people, and you will be able to see our biases in the map. Uh, we have mapped a lot of different approaches, methods, uh, framework, as you can see on this uh, screenshot uh, from our website. So if you are interested to learn more after this short intro introduction, feel free to dive in. We have written a lot of things. We also have recorded a lot of videos, uh, talked at different conferences. So there is a lot of material on our YouTube channel. We are also having a self-paced video course, about five hours now of video material where you can deep dive uh, into all of this yeah. ideas of octopologies. We have a lot of maps. So we figure out we are in the business of mapping. So we have a lot of maps for different things and people who practice with us, people who we call champions. Uh, we share a lot of maps with them and they use them uh, to help shape their organizations. Right? So we're going to start very easy and slow and build up from there. So the essence of the map is actually the axes and the boxes and the space between the boxes as you, you, you'll be able to see that. Well, that's the first box, right? It's far from agile. It's a single skilled individual which doing some task. Uh, these people, these archetypes have space on the map because our map is inclusive. It's not just for agile teams or agile minded or organization. We would like to have a map where every organization, no matter at which stage of development it is, will be able to find itself. So this is the minimal work unit you can have. A, a, per, a person doing some applying single skill Right? We all understand this archetype is not super adaptive because if this person 
you know, gets sick or goes to vacation or something happens, well, the work will be stalled. So, of course, there is a more adaptive archetype on the map, which is a bunch of such people working together. An example here can be, you know, like now a lot of companies are looking into AI and now you are hiring, you know, the first AI engineer for your company, like a data scientist or gen AI in, uh, developer. And of course, you, you can put him here in a team or, but if you have a lot of teams, maybe they would compete too much for this person. So you are making a choice to put this person in a team of one person. So this a person becomes a team of itself and it's this the first box on the map few months later you were successful with your ai pilots and now you hired a few more ai developers and you put them all together so they can talk about ai all the time and teach each other and work as a functional group that would be the second archetype on the map and, and it of makes course sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it makes sense to have a functional group like that because it makes your organization more adaptive. If you're if if you have multiple people that do the same thing and you plan for having this AI knowledge that you need in your project that you're delivering, then it's good to have multiple people sitting there because it's easier to find somebody if you if with that skill if you need them. Um, there's one one more thing that I need to say actually because Alexei, you've been using the word archetypes like four times already. And uh, we, we kind of chose that word to name boxes uh, as archetypes because it's, the, it's like a typical way of uh, organizing people to do work in companies. And we find very, very different forms and shapes of these archetypes. Yeah. And, and the map that we make actually is an overview of archetypes. Yeah, so hopefully after we finish building up the map, you'll be able to know all these 16 archetypes and, and you'll be easily, you'll be able to easily recognize them because they they exist, you know, out there in the world. Yeah. And then, of course, the third archetype would, would be, hey, you know, we have so many people, so, so many teams asking for these AI people to do work. So there were a lot of dependencies. How about we put, you know, those different skills maybe there was a qa group uh, separate maybe there was a backend group front-end group how about we put them together in a team right so typically in an agile space we call this cross-functional units we call this here multi-skill unit and of course it's nothing new for, for you we're speaking for an agile user group so hopefully you're not learning anything new here but well the map has these archetypes and even in a super agile company, you still might have functional groups because you're never able to put everybody, you know, into an agile team. Even in a lot of agile companies, uh, we still have sales departments, marketing departments, HR departments, and they are typically functional groups. They are not merged into a cross-functional work. But this third archetype here uh, on this on this map. It's the first team somehow, right? Because now you put people with different skills into this unit and now they're working together and they don't need to go and ask for a manager, uh, you know, to do something. They can just, a, a developer can just turn to his colleague a tester and ask to test whatever uh, he has just finished a building. So of course, this archetype even more adaptive because they got faster feedback. And the, the last archetype on this horizontal axis would be this one. So well, what is cooler than a multi-skill unit? And we found this paper, uh, probably some of you know this, is from, I think, 1987, Harvard Business Review. It was the first paper on Scrum. It was called The New New Product Development Game from two Japanese guys, Takichi and Nanaka, and they coined this term multi-learning. This article actually is available online for free from HBR, and I really recommend going through that if you have not done it yet. So they introduced this term multi-learning, which is still a little bit of puzzle for a lot of Scrum masters and Scrum teams. So a good Scrum team is not just a team where you put different skills together. That would be the third archetype. It's actually a team where people start to forget their initial specialization and they all work together, you know, on whatever is important to be worked on today. 
And that's why on a daily Scrum meeting, if they realize, hey, you know, testing is a bottleneck, they all do testing today. So the this fourth archetype, it's an archetype where on the first, um, so firstly, you, you, you put a lot of skills to, uh, together to cut all those dependencies between the teams and between the groups. And secondly, because you've put a lot of skills together, people start loading those skills and uh, start spreading those skills in a team. And this team becomes even a better team. So a good Scrum team, to me as a Scrum master, is not just a mix of skills, but it's where people start acquiring multiple skills, everybody. Hmm. And um, uh, as, as we're looking at these four archetypes, you can see that that these building blocks, there's there's also space between them, mm. and that that space between those uh, archetypes is actually maybe even more important than the archetype itself. We recognize the archetypes. We recognize the incomplete team. We recognize you know the complete team and and, and the self learningness of them. Mm -hmm. But to to move from one box to another, maybe without knowing unconsciously, we need to adopt new ideas. We need to. Agree, for instance, when we when we move from single skill individuals and we see that there is more value in groups of people doing functional, you know, functional departments doing functional work, then then we need to understand. We need to have this mental model that you know people really enjoy collaborating, working together, sitting together, talking about their work. And the next step would be moving from functional groups to multi skill unit. Is wait a minute? We always thought that different specialists have difficulties in communicating with each other, but actually that's not true. If we put a developer and a tester together, they can really communicate. Mm. Actually, some wow. magic happens. Sorry? Wow, I'm saying. That's wow, a... yeah. <laughs> some magic happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a discovery. Yeah, that's a discovery, yeah. But, but as long as we firmly believe that it really doesn't make sense to put specialists together because they because they speak a different language they don't understand each other and we need to coordinate them to make sure that there is some work done well then you will never make that step towards creating teams you know right. multi skill units yeah so 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 the, those gaps those skips between the boxes we say even more important than the boxes yeah. because there's a the, they are those mental barriers or a paradigm shift or mindset mindset changes or cultural changes, you turn different names to them uh, in the agile world that we actually need to help people uncover. Uh, by the way, uh, the difference between the third box and the fourth box is about going from resource thinking to like human thinking. When you, you, you know, we you typically hear in the agile space, hey, don't call people resources, right? Well, it's not just because it's ugly to call an individual a resource, but it it just actually because resources, like like a machine, right? It has a predefined set of skills. You cannot teach a machine to do something new. Like your vacuum cleaner, it just cleans you now with vacuum. That's what it does. So when you are when you are on this third level with a multi-skill unit, which is incomplete team. Uh, you as a manager have this belief then hey you know people have fixed skills and uh, if i have this work i'm looking at work and i look at skills that require to do the work i'll go and i find the team that is suitable that is fit to do the work so you go and you try to find the team so like work will follow the team when you're reaching the fourth archetype which we believe is like the most advanced it is where you start seeing, okay, people are not resources. People can learn, people can acquire new skills. And here in this paradigm, you are giving work that is not 100% aligned with existing skills in a team because you believe people will be able to learn new skills. So here, not work follows teams, but teams follow work. A team takes work and goes to whichever repository, right? They might end up. So that's like a very different, um, you know, change. And me as a Scrum Master Agile coach, I still believe we are kind of stuck in our Agile implementations at around this third archetype. There is still a lot of improvements in many Scrum teams or in many teams who call themselves Scrum teams to go to these four levels where actually management starts, start, uh, starts trusting them 
and giving them work that they've never done before. Mm. Right? There's a question in the chat uh, related to this, talking about um, Scrum and derived concepts. You have the concept of T-shaped professionals. Therefore, in complete team with task focus, you are you talk about the horizontal T bar, the horizontal T bar of the T. Yeah. So that is broadening um, uh, the. Expertise. We actually don't want T people because, like a T, a person is somebody who has very deep knowledge in one area, one thing, yeah. and very small knowledge in other areas. Those people are not really useful. So we're talking about like M shape people actually or specialists or or broken palm people or yeah. whatever you call uh, th th this ugly letter people but we actually believe people can grow multiple deep specialties yeah. so i'm a developer and it's not a fantasy you know i've programmed four or five different languages and with more with the next language it was easier to learn the next one so you can you, you can develop this and especially these days with the gen generative AI, with uh, tools like Copilot, who can explain you what this code does. I think we we are getting there where people can much easier and quicker learn new things. And maybe th this AI, you know, plugins that we can have might help us to move to this fourth archetype on the map, okay? So what's new in this for you? Hopefully nothing new in this for you because you are agile practitioners and every self-respecting team coach understands this. And my job and Roland's job as a Scrum Master has always been you know, to help team make this journey towards you know, multi-learning unit. But it's not the only dimension. And that's oh, where and that's where something might come to a surprise to some of you. And this was the discovery for us. Yeah, so we are discovering octopologies with you. And now we discovered, hey, well, one thing is to have completeness of skills. You can have as many skills as you want in a unit, but question mark, to what you apply that skill? Are you applying this to a task or to a problem? Right? Are you given a task or a feature to, to build or a customer problem to solve? And this comes this vertical axis, which we call scope of work, or sometimes we refer to it as a scope of ownership or scope of what you are caring about, right? That's at which level you're applying that skill. And of course, because we like symmetry, we also you know, created these four levels. Uh, going vertical, of course, you can be somewhere in between. You can think of more levels, but we believe four levels horizontal and four levels vertical give enough archetypes to cover a lot of cases. Well, for now we do, and uh, we never say never. It's a discovery. Uh, right. uh, so if 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 some some someday we'll discover that there is a need for a fifth row or, or sure, we're going to add it. Then, then we add it. Yeah, we yeah, don't know yet. I'll meet up with you to update you guys on the map. <laughs> so speaking of the vertical axis, vertical axes are different focuses or foci is a proper English for plural of focuses. Uh, and the lowest level, you can have the task focus. You know, you just give people you know, work to do at the higher level. A bit higher level, you have feature focus, and we all understand what features are in agile space. But uh, there are these two highest levels that we've discovered with Roland. Uh, we call them product part focus and whole product focus. And this is applicable to product development organization. If you are just a business organization, maybe you can, this is a business part focus and whole business focus. So at these higher levels, teams that are there they understand you know much more than a typical team would do they understand the business model they understand the customer journeys they know how to talk to customers and we're gonna cover those today but yeah pre preparing you mentally for that that there is a build up going up now question to you um you know like imagine an agile team and of course each of us has different understanding of what an agile team is. But if you think of an agile team, like uh, what other people, you know, managers of large German companies would think of an agile team, which level 
and I'm talking about a vertical level agile teams are operating at. Task focus, uh, feature focus, part focus, or whole product focus? Where would you put a... Let's just, let's just think of the typical agile team. Yeah. And you can put that, your answer in the chat. Which row will it be? The first, second, third, fourth? Where would you put a agile team? You can use the chat uh, to put your answers. Well, if you don't get answers, maybe the question is too difficult. Well, you will hear our answer. Ah. Uh, in in our context, any any, any level, uh, top. We should aim. Well, you should aim for top. But yeah, that, exactly. Top. We should aim for top. That's it. Mixed, mixed. Yeah, B three. Yeah, so I was doing this talk today um, uh, for another group of people in Sweden, and the first question they asked me, like, what do you mean by Agile? And I'm like, okay, here, here we go. Uh, uh, but actually, this is the problem, right, in our space. Agile is so vaguely defined. Even group of Agile practitioners meeting at a meetup <laughs> ask themselves, what do you mean by Agile? Wow. It's, isn't that funny? You know, like a horseman would get together and ask each, ourselves, what is a horse? So we, 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 <laughs> we have a problem with it agile, right? And uh, actually, this map, you will see today, it will give you a much more precise answer what you mean by agile. And different companies, different teams might understand agile differently, and this is okay. As soon as long as they actually, you know, do what they want to, to do. So as the answers to your question are a little bit diverse, um, <laughs> I would like to I would like to continue on answering the question, yes. um, which is, well, it, most teams that I see in companies that I go to are working at features. They're responsible for a certain feature or what they call their application, maybe, or they have a set of features, the search team or the the the, the order. App team. Uh, Right, team. app team. You know, there's 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 this element that they take care of, or set of features that they're responsible for, and they will be the ones to do the changes or fix the bugs, hopefully, when there is a problem in that area. We all know where to go to when there's a problem with the search engine. You have to go to the search team. So that would be typical um, uh, an, uh, one of those agile teams that we're talking about. But here, something magical happens. You know, like, um, if you have an Agile team... So well, you mean magic happens when you go from Y to A, right? When you go from purple to red, yeah? Yeah, yeah. when you do this jump and you have a team, right, which is maybe doesn't have all the skills yet, but it is uh, trusted to get the work done in the feature level. One magical thing happens is that, wow, you don't need to micromanage the team anymore. If at the lowest level, at the purple level, you had to understand what everybody of the of the team or the group was doing, you as a manager had to go and to control every individual, you still can micromanage agile teams if you are mentally sick, but you don't have to do it. Uh, the power of Scrum and the power of agile teams is that you know they have enough skills to actually get things done. And this is actually still some companies, you know, I still yet to uncover uh, the, the, this magical element. But now, if you have this team, which is called an agile team, which can be given work, and in two weeks you come to review this work and the work is done, and they even talk to clients, customers to validate it, and it's working. Now you as a manager, you kind of don't have any more work to do, do you? So what, do, what does the manager does when he has this functional agile team? The job of the manager changes. You don't need to control anymore what individuals of the teams are doing. You're managing this whole unit now as single unit. Those teams becomes your building block. And now because you have so much time freed you can think better of which features those teams should be working on. So in other words, that idea of a product owner in Scrum, right? It's a person who is ordering and prioritizing work because his teams are able to solve those problems. 
And yeah, on on the Octopologist map, you can show it uh, by going from the purple level uh, to uh, orange level. But that's not the only magic uh, there is. Okay. Um, now, what changes from the previous map is that we show you these letters and numbers by one, a two. And actually, actually, that's that's one one of the most brilliant moves actually uh, that came to us when we made this map is is this naming convention that is so super simple, just a letter and a number combination. But this this now gives us a language to speak. I can say to Alexei, I've been to a customer and they were predominantly a Y1 organization with a couple of A2 and I saw one A3 team. Then he knows, he knows what the setup is of how this company works. And he has an idea of, ah, if there's a lot of Y1, well, there must be some project management going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tasks, you know, micromanagement. So yeah, this so is very this clear. Whole, yeah. So yep. you tell me Y1, and if I know org topologies, I have this, I understand the dynamics of that organization. Well, if you also to tell me how many people there are, I will be able to extrapol extrapolate from them. From that, and now Roland, if you tell me, hey, I'm doing an agile transformation, and I'm like, what do you mean by that? Because then <laughs> actually nothing. But you, you say we actually going from Y1 to A2. I'm yeah, like, there's oh, three three hundred Y1 people that we're moving into X amount of A2. Yeah, I understand your pain and your headache, and I understand actually what you're trying to do. Now imagine it's not only Roland who is an agile coach for this company understand this, but everybody in the company understand and agreed. Imagine how cool would it be that we are going from here, we're going there. It will create a lot of transparency, a lot of clarity, and because it's no longer about agile, schmagile, no? It's about changing the teams, the way teams are structured. So because you would like to add to the team, so it's a structural change which needs to happen. And if it hasn't happened, people will start asking good questions like why we still have old functional groups if we haven't if we're doing agile. And the next thing which that should happen in this transformation in this, those A2 groups, teams, they need to be trusted to work on the features without being micromanaged. So nobody from the manager should come to a daily stand up and ask who is busy today and who is not busy. It's no, no longer the job of a manager. And now if the company agrees, we're going from Y1 to from Y1 to A2, they would expect these things. And that creates very, this cr cr creates maybe painful, but radical transparency. Yeah, then uh, Simon says, hey, but wait a minute, uh, people in Y1 could be doing Kanban. Yes, of course, why not? I mean. Uh, if they want to, they can they can manage their work doing Kanban. But it's maybe maybe that process that they're using to do their work is is not as important as the fact that there is a Y1 group. You know, there's people who have the same skill set, and they 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 sit together in a department. And other organizational elements need that skill they have to complete work that is higher up uh, on on the vertical axis. But we'll look at this later when we look more at. Uh, the ecosystem uh, that that has been created to deliver value. So Simon, hold on with your question, maybe or your remark for later. And there's a hand going up by Kurt Jaeger. So just, Kurt, if that is okay for you, just one remark to the Kanban and tasks. In my, I mean, then you you do tasks via Kanban. Right. What is not not the idea? Uh, a Kanban board is not moving task; it's moving something you can deliver. So um, yes. I, so maybe we come to that later, right? Yeah. Not really, but I think it's a good comment. And I think Kanban, it can be applied in every box. Yep. It's just a way to visualize work, whichever the work is. If it's tasks, well, tasks, but it doesn't have to be tasks. You can use a Kanban here, there, everywhere. That's why Kanban, I think, is actually broader than Agile. And it's not really... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I will kill Kanban from the board, not to confuse it anymore, but yes. And, and and then another paradigm shift, right? What's the paradigm shift from going from Y to A? Well, and this going from Y to A can be called an agile transformation. Um, it is basically 
building these work units that if they assembled right, they can self-manage to solve problems. And this is a huge paradigm okay. shift for a lot of people still. And you can visualize it with, uh, with our topologists. So we're not teaching you Agile because we know you are Agile practitioners, but we are using these Agile examples that, that you understand to show you the mapping technique that we have developed. So focus on the technique, on the map, and not on our simple stories. But essentially, what we're trying to demonstrate to you today with Roland is that this is a visual language now, right? Which you can use to communicate your org development direction. You can you don't have to call your change Agile anymore. You can be much more specific. You can go from Y1 to Y3, if that's what you want, which will be, uh, I guess, fo uh, focusing very much on operational aspects of things. Going from Y1 to Y3 would be, you know, automating a lot of things, not really letting teams build features, keep them focused on the task level, but make sure they are very efficient. And I guess, uh, for some companies, this can be a very important focus to optimize operational aspects. Mm -hmm. But if you are into optimizing a product development aspects of your work, then I guess you should consider looking up and going up the map. So, yes, wait a minute. Can you stay a little, a little bit longer here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jessica asks, so we, we said that this map can also be used for non-agile uh, teams or, or groups. Mm -hmm. And actually she says, well, um, I wonder where classic project teams operate. They are often more task oriented, but require uh, resources across different functions. They rarely think in terms of features. Well, if they don't think in terms of features, they will be on the Y level. And then um, the, you will need maybe some people that do think in features on the A level to prepare the work for them and to coordinate those projects. So as you, as you, you know, so when, when you see this concept, they will be spread across yeah. this part of the map, probably uh, managers or people who understand some higher concepts. Well, somebody like if your teams don't understand features, well, somebody should be there who understands features. Yeah, of course, somebody should. Or there should be somebody in the organization who knows. <laughs> so at least there will be somebody, maybe a program manager or a project manager who understands features, talk to customers, write down requirements, and then you know uh, give them to. Uh, functional groups and those groups can either understand features being a level or be given breakdown and tasks at the Y level. So it will be really dependent, but typically the typical project management, I would say, uh, stays on this, you know, left part of the map. Yep. And the agile friendly archetypes are on this part of the map, but uh, that m might not be the rule, but that, that is how I would map yep. that. Yeah, and business analysts typically, if if they're operating uh, on their own, Alice, they would be uh, uh, if they're business analysts at the feature level, they would be in A zero. They're an individual. And we were gonna have more slides on that, so hold on. Um, anyways, see, I, I mean, uh, it's important to actually start asking this question. Did you asking? You can download the map from our website, like a PDF, or use a mirror board that you can share again from our website and do your do your mapping. Right, so it's important that you do the, the mapping and you understand together with your colleagues where would we put our groups, our managers. Then that can trigger some interesting d d discussions. Anyways, uh, speaking about the horizontal move, going left to right, we figure out, and I'll let you read these four, er uh, these six errors. These are the indicators that we expect going down or going up. For people who are maybe not watching the video, I probably should read that aloud. So we would expect a uh, number of blocking cross-team dependencies to go down. We would expect transactional costs. So how difficult it is to put stuff in into production to go down. Because teams are faster, so because transactional costs will be lower. Because functional and because they are automate. We would expect number of roles in teams go down yeah. because of multi-learning. You are no longer a backend Java developer, you're just a team member. And yes, you have very high specialty in backend and Java, but not only that. Yes, today you've learned how to automate testing, for example. Yeah. And then we expect these things to go up. Completeness of, in terms of definition of done will go up if you're going right. Essentially, the this axis is, is about definition of done. 
So the go the more right you go, the more full the team is with the definition of done. Shared code ownership should go down. It's no longer your code or my code, it's our code, and we're gonna work on this. Maybe other teams still have their own code, but at least at the team level, there will be shared code ownership and teams will learn to learn. So teams learning capabilities will grow. So this would be six high level indicators and metrics that we brainstorm with Roland. We would like to see that will indicate that you are progressing rightwards yeah. on the map. Now let, let's have a look at the map when it's complete. As you can see, there's already four by four boxes in the last yeah. one, but we also fill them in. We, as we said already, we give them a, a letter and number combination to, to refer to them easily when we talk about archetypes. But we also dis made a description of each archetype. So um, as you go up, you will see that uh, tasks will go to features, and product part and product. And as you go from left to right, it's the single skill, functional group, incomplete team and complete team that will change. And this is, you know, the same all over the board. So it gives you a, lo a logical uh, way to navigate, actually, and to ask yourself, if you look at a team, where would they be? Are they complete or incomplete? Is it a team or an individual? What do they work on? Tasks or features? Right. This gives you a way to navigate the map pretty easily. Yeah, and uh, it took us quite a while with Roland to actually find all the examples possible. In the first um, like year of work topologies, we typically work for focusing on the like agile teams uh, and like advanced agile teams who are learning broader. And we talked about you know functional groups, of course, and maybe component teams. But we were not sure who resides here. But over time, talking to different people like you, we figure out, yes, those elements exist. And now we can easily give you examples of essentially any box or almost any box. Good. Yeah. So so before I go to Kurt, there's a question about uh, uh -huh. what's the difference between product and whole product? Well, we, we want to use the terminology whole product um, to indicate that this is really the product as seen from the through the eyes of the customer. So when you ask people in an organization, like, uh, what, what product are you working on? Chances are, uh, if they're at feature level, they will give you the name of a product that actually is an application inside a multitude of applications that together deliver some kind of value to the customer. And th that customer sees the whole product, which is something he wants to pay for that, you know, reduces his pain, that solves his problem. So that's why we really want, to, want you to understand that when we talk about product, it's the whole product as seen by the customer. Hmm. Good. Yeah, I, I like your uh, I like your idea very very much. Um, it is uh, also very much from the perspective of a team, right? So uh, if, for example, if you have a team and a team is able to uh, really maintenance, develop, do everything for a whole product, so ten people, one product then uh, uh, I, I understand the team focus very, very much. I like it. I mean, so now if you have a product which needs a 10 teams or a five, so it is as huge from the, from the customer's perspective, let's say a car, it's even a 10 teams will not be sufficient. But if, mm. if it's a, a, a huge product, then you need many teams to, uh, to build the whole product. So... Um, is that then a, a, a B th in the German industry, let's say, is that more a B or more a C level point of view? From well, it, it depends on what the teams work on. If all okay. the teams okay. are working together on the concept of the car and they yeah. all understand the car demands, okay. then that would indicate that they're probably C level. Great answer. Thank you. Yep. Welcome. Now, and of course, in a large company, when you do this mapping, you realize, or oh, actually, we need more than four levels to describe all this embedded situation. Like we were doing mapping with uh, one of our colleagues from a large German company, and we identified actually like seven levels. Uh, like you can go, you can expand, expand, and expand, and expand. And just because we would like to pr provide a map that you know, you can start thinking about your situation and then maybe, and then maybe draw your own version that is suitable for your context. Then, of course, you might have, you know, more levels going up. But essentially, 
if we, if we really simplify that, you either are doing tasks, so so you are you you are not asked to think. You just given work. That would be the Y level. At the A level, you are given some features to build, and typically you are repetitive, repetitively given the same kind of work. So at A level, you typically have like teams, which names indicate what they're capable of doing. Like at the A level, you likely to have search team, iOS team, you know, payment team, whatever you know, uh, portfolio, you know, like uh, retention team, activation team. If if you have in a company teams which names represent what they're working on. This is a very, you know, like highly probable indicator they are at the Y or A level. At the B level, likely you have teams with very abstract names, like something from Star Wars, for example. <laughs> and these teams are learning to do different things. So at a B level or a C level, there will be no more search team, but there will be a bunch of teams and uh, working together. And if there is a search demand, something needs to be done with search, they might compete for this item. And one team will say, hey, we actually been working a lot on search before because, you know, remember all times we, we were that search team. Now we are a Venus team. But because we still have a very deep search, you know, competency, why don't you give this to us? And other teams will say, actually, no, we're not giving that to you, to, to you even uh, actually for the same reason that you know this. How about we take it, uh, a Mars team or a Venus team or Saturn team, we take it because we never have work on this. And you will teach us how this search thing work. Why would you want a team to do something they've never done before? Because now they have a shared backlog, shared roadmap. And they look that, oh, actually, there will be a lot of search work in our roadmap for the next half a year. We're going to rework a lot the search. So it will be not enough just for one team to know this. And at all times, we had one search team and it was suboptimal. At a B level, you have just five teams working as a one team, and you want all these five teams to you know, be uh, relevant uh, in terms of the upcoming roadmap. So at the B and C level, it's very likely uh, that the teams are cooperating. The boundaries between the teams erase a little bit. People travel from a team to team. Teams do some multi-team events. They share code. They share knowledge. They share meetings if they want. They share roadmap. They share product managers who are no longer attached to individual teams. Uh, so you have a lot of shared things going on, uh, and teams learn a lot of things uh, that they will that they that they believe will be beneficial for them. They're not learning th things because it's fun to learn. No, they're all learning search because they see there will be a lot of search work in a roadmap, and one team will be a bottleneck. That's why they do it. Now that we've given you these sixteen archetypes, you can you can start thinking of your development R&D department or your, your, your group uh, that makes product and try to see how value is being created. Because right. maybe, you know, if you plot all the teams and people and uh, departments that are involved in delivering value to the customer, you can see maybe that there is this architect who, who designs how, how stuff needs to be built or what it should look like and gives the specifications uh, to an analyst. Well, this architect thinks of, you know, in, 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 at the customer problem level and then breaks down those, those ideas maybe for a certain area of the product to give that to an analyst team that only works on the chassis of the car or, I don't know, you know, some, some part of the product. Right. Then they can then further decompose that work to, to pass it on to what the front-end team needs to do uh, or the back-end team needs to do. And so, but together as an ecosystem, you know, they are capable of delivering value. Right. So, so this is a this is a systemic view, right? So uh, you can use octopologies to map, uh, you know, and uh, track development of an individual team. It's okay, but we actually recommend you, especially in a scaled environment, uh, to map the entire ecosystem because typically you have a lot of different units uh, collaborating and interacting with each other 
maybe with dependencies or maybe information. Edward, you have a question, right? Or yeah. Hand, please. Uh, yeah, all good. I just wait. Um, I have very often a situation that I have even below the Y team, uh, let's say Z team setting, where it's not a team. So a person is part of many teams. So especially if you have projects, not products. So a person is not only in one team, so you can say this is one team, but you have a person which is in three or four teams yeah. and three or four project teams in parallel. And uh, so, and because they are specialists and because, and then they do only tasks, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it's just because it's a specialist. Yeah. Is that is that part of your uh, your analyzing or your uh, your topology thing? Because I found that very often. So below a fully right. staffed, 100% why team which doing tasks I have an even worse situation mm -hmm. well that would be more y0 I think it's not we don't I don't think we need z for that it would be individuals and on top of the individuals you would have a matrix organization with a lot of what you call teams that they're participating in but actually they're not teams a team a team in our concept you know going in in the two and the three columns yeah, yeah. Where we talk about teams it's more stable teams. It's the, the yeah, concept yeah. of an agile team. Absolutely right? with you. But I found the, the the worst case where it's not really teams. They name teams, but they don't behave no. like no. right? This is a very common thing. So yeah. it's very typical that for Y-level uh, individuals, Y0 individuals, they are particip part participating in many simultaneous projects. At the same time, they are invited to many meetings because they don't actually understand those projects, but they know their skill uh, needs to be applied there. So they, they actually don't care. This is this is why those people are at the Y level, because they don't care about that project, that deadline, the customer, the business need. They are so busy switching context from a meeting to a meeting to a code base to a code base. This guy just knows he needs to add this AI capability to this a code base, for example. And that's why these people are actually not able to elevate, as we say, above, because they just uh, switching context. The only way for people and teams to actually elevate from Y to A and even above is to, you know, stay connected to some mission and empathize to some some customers and users and then they will be able to understand the problems i uh, all of you have this situation as scrum masters you in, invite typically this y zero people to your spring planning and they just send you in an email like not interested they're not interested in your sprint planning in your spring goal in your sprint they just need to they just need you to tell them where they need to apply their code it's not, it's not because they are bad people or stupid. No, actually, it's a smart way to do. Because if you're, op if you're optimizing you, the usage, the applicability of their, you know, narrowly available skill, the smart way to do would be to skip all those blah, blah, spring planning and just do work. So it's logical. But only putting those people in real teams, stable teams, long-lived teams, like we say in Scrum, only they, they now have not many projects, but just one that is, you can also call now a product. And then they start learning and understanding uh, broader things. And then in a year or two, you will see, oh, did, did this guy actually now asking interesting question? And he's not only a backend Java developer, but he grew into testing and automation and business analysis. And this person, has made a personal development from here, like to here, you know, like agile transformation is actually a personal thing. It's about people changing their way of looking at work. So, um, yeah. And uh, if you map these ecosystems, going back to ecosystem mapping and systemic view, a naive agile coach will say, let's upgrade Y2 team. Let's make Y2 team agile. But wait a minute, it's not going to work. You can add a lot of, you know, magical dust and a lot of meetings, a lot of artifacts. We call this way of working, right? But this team will not get agile because why this team is not agile, meaning why this team is not A3 or A2. Well, this team is not agile or they are 
locked at the Y2 level. They are locked here because of these people not inviting them to think about the problems, about the customers. They are, these people in this team, they are giving shuffle ready work. So why do I care about your agile stuff? So yeah. you can add uplift a single team, I guess. You need to change the ecosystem. And this is such an old construct that right. has come from the industrial revolution where the hands were separated from the heads. You know, this is, this is, this, and, and it's still applied because if mm. an organization optimizes for resource utilization, then they probably are really happy with this kind of setup. You know, everybody is fully optimized and busy. Okay. Um, so we am um, checking the time around. We have half an hour to go. Yeah. So, yeah. so we need to speed up a little bit. Map we have where do you want to jump in? Maybe a little bit about the perfection. Yeah. The top right corner, C3, that's the perfection that we had in mind with Roland. We are biased by Scrum, by teams. We also biased uh, by, you know, highest adaptability which people in a less community, large scale scrum community to talk a lot about. So for us, like, you know, the highest definition, the nirvana of agile, you can say, would be a team that understands the entire product and can touch any part of code. How sweet would that be? Of course, it's not possible, or it's possible at a very young stage of a company like a startup, right? When uh, five is, people... Yeah, and a dog. You're forgetting the dog and the garage. <laughs> yeah, when five people with a dog in the garage are doing business, they all understand as a unit the entire business, not just the product, but also the business model and the customers and the partners. And they all are learning so much every day because what you know in a startup world that you're solving the wrong problem. So you're learning and learning. That's why they are high and on the right side of the map. And of and course, even, yeah. over time, when this company is successful, the business model is validated, the customers are now pulling value, they start growing. And of course, there will be different ways how companies grow, but very typical. Uh, way of growing. And this model, yeah, um, org topologies is like a probabilistic model. Very typically, you will see this happening. Company, A company will age and it will not be aging well. It will be aging <laughs> ugly and growing, you know, different departments, diff different units, different functions. Because it's unthoughtful design. People are not going to, in a startup, you're not going to think about the real organizational design. It just grows organically. We need an extra full stack developer. Where is he going to sit? Well, together with the guy who invented the system and created the first code to learn uh, what the system is about. So automatically we will create like silos or, or departments with right. people that have the same skill. It's, it's, it's obvious. Of, why wouldn't you, why would you do it different? Literally? Yeah, you create a lot of offenses around different functions. Not, not because you're stupid, but because you, your goal is to, you know, go fast and, uh, yeah. and uh, onboard people super fast. It doesn't have to be like this, but proba proba probabilistically, right? Like in 98% of cases, that what will happen to a company over time, it will become slow and compartmentalized. Yeah, bureaucratic. And then w once we're there, we see that we need to do something to beat competitors, or we see that we need to do change because we're, we're, we're too slow in delivering to the market. So what's going to happen? We're going to try to, for instance, introduce agile in these organizations and try to create agile teams. And, and what we're doing then is slowly actually moving back up towards that perfection vision that, that we had, like to, to, to become more adaptable, to become more adaptive the way but we used to be as a startup. This picture is like, if you really would like to, you know, go back, uh, rejuvenate, you know, bring back the youth of the company, it's not enough just to start doing daily scrums and putting stickies on the wall. Uh, really? You need to, I mean, you've changed uh, structurally. So if you like to be agile, you need to change structurally again. You need to bring people 
to start learning again and understanding the product and customers again. Yeah. It's not achieved by post-its and mirror boards and especially not with Jira. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if the, if the going down is typically called scaling, the going up, you can call it descaling, right? So you can map the descaling move. And for us with Roland being anchored and biased, again, with uh, simplifying organizations, uh, doing the agile is descaling, is removing think, think about it. unnecessary things. Yeah, think about it. It's not just because scaling uh, and then descaling or, or unscaling that we, that we use that word. It really happens. Descaling really happens. And this is... You know, if you if you bridge from A to B, if you go towards the higher archetypes, that's why so many companies are, are not, unable to do it. Mm -hmm. You really need to go for a deep change, a real change. And for, to give an example, at the A level, if you've created all these agile teams, you've got all these product owners with their team. Their, per team, there's a product owner. So in order to, 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 to work as a group on a bigger problem than just a feature, you would have to put product backlogs together into one product backlog at a higher level, like a customer journey level, which means you got too many product owners. You need to get rid of those product owners. So it's moving up means less backlogs, less product owners. That's yeah. really scaling. It's getting smaller. So uh, to zoom out a little bit from this the discussion, yeah. So we figured with Roland, we have like two missions that we're fulfilling. One mission is to remind people what true agility is. And for us, true agility is actually descaling, simplifying, and going back to, you know, that uh, perfection state. Probably a large company will never go back to that C3 perfection state, but it's a nice journey. And second mission of us is actually to give a tool where people can be just, you know, uh, transparent and clear. I mean, you know, before octopologies were in, in, invented, people will, will would say to each other, hey, we're doing this agile transformation. And they will, you know, bullshit, I'm sorry, each other with, with that. Not anymore. Now with octopologies, you can come and say, hey, you say you're doing this agile transformation. So where are you now? You're here, right? Okay. And what are you doing? Oh, you're going there. Fine. You don't need to call it agile you don't need to call it anything it's your journey if you believe in the company that's the best thing that needs to happen in your company fantastic if you if you decide to actually to go back i mean that's also fine i uh, actually i've seen companies who go from feature teams back to component teams i mean as long as you are knowing what you're doing and it's thoughtful and people agree and put some time thinking, it's fine. But just don't call it agile because it, it, it has no meaning. Be more specific. And Octopologist, we figured, is a way to be more specific. Um, and uh, that's how we use it. So um, a few maybe more it's things. interesting to, maybe it's in, we need to choose what we work on, right? Maybe uh, do, do map, map some frameworks. Would that be interesting? Maybe a few words about high-level archetypes and okay. then the mapping, right? So uh, this higher part of the map, the green, the beautiful green color that we picked for you, um, it's what we see is an uncharted territory for a lot of companies. This is, of course, a random number, 97%, but it's just to you know catch your attention. For a lot of companies, it is, they don't know that. Every client I got as a org, org consultant, agile coach, they are somewhere here. And uh, they want to become more agile, more fluid, more faster, right? And they don't even know what multi-team scrum can be. And so this higher part of the map, that's where, as I explained a little bit um, um, uh, before today, and we have the full module on this in our video course, we explain what is that high level archetype is. And we interview people from several real companies who actually work like this. Because for many of us, like for me, four or five years ago, I wouldn't be able even to imagine how those companies exist, right? So, so this is this place where I think our industry eventually will go to. But first of all, we need to 
break this uh, this barrier here going from resource thinking into helping people to learn new skills with AI. I think this will be possible. And the next barrier is this barrier uh, going from single Scrum to multi-team Scrum and to uh, things well, not like, necessarily but, Scrum, right? But team of teams uh, collaborating, multi -team, maybe and, uh, whatever. But like multi-team to 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 treat these people above as a team of teams. Well, this is uh, what we call if, if the first area has been the area where we've been working in over the past fifteen to twenty years to try to create faster teams and to understand agile. Then yes. that would be the first wave of the agile revolution since the agile manifesto right yeah. uh, was exactly. introduced and even before we all were working and going crazy about making agile teams yeah agile team agile team agile team and now we have agile teams but they are new silos uh yeah. if 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 a stakeholder needs to do something uh in terms of their you know increasing attention to the product but he has an app team, a search team, a platform team, a backup team. These teams aren't able, that org design is not able uh, to satisfy this customer. So the second wave of Agile, so we don't believe Agile is that. We believe we need to put new meanings into what Agile is. And for us, the, the, this new uh, definition of Agile, which is actually equal to the old definition, we just you know misinterpret the Agile manifesto somehow, it is, creating this high level archetypes as we call them. A few words about naming. Uh, why is why are we doing this with people? A is for agile teams or agile at the team level. B is when the teams are able to work around a business stakeholder. So typically at the B level, you find a stakeholder with a long lasting you know, need, unresolved need maybe increase retention to a product. And this stakeholder has budget, owns PL responsibility, you know, is a part of the board of directors. And then you give this stakeholder a bunch of teams that are working together long term with this stakeholder. And then in another part of a company, you have another stakeholder and you give him several teams. So you start building these circles and they become your new silos because a team's working with a red stakeholder would not know anything about teams working with a blue stakeholder. But that's not a problem necessarily. But, but that's the, no, not a problem, but at every level you're gonna have silos, right? Yep. They are just maybe better silos Right. So when you're moving up, you, it's not going to solve your problems, but yeah, you're going to so, have better problems to solve. Yeah. So at A level, you had walls around each team. Yeah. Each team has its own backlog, its own port corner, its own Scrum, its own Kanban board. At a B level, you have a bunch of teams working together. At a C level, and it's not necess necessarily that you would like to go there, but you build some fluidity and either teams can travel, you know, if I if I take this uh, up, uh, oh what happened? I think I closed me, me mirror. No. No, you're there. No, I'm not. I'm there. Uh, so at a C level, um, it, it's either it's either your company is small enough and everybody. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not able to do what I want to do. But I, what I'm trying to do is actually just go back. At a, at a C level, it's you still can have uh, different stakeholders and different teams, but the teams will kind of uh, more fluidly, you know, travel from a stakeholder to a stakeholder, from a part of a product to a part of, of the product. You don't have walls between the teams, but all the teams understand we are working in one company. And yes. Uh, this quarter, I'm working more on, on the green part, and next quarter, I'm working on the red part, but you build the fluidity in. That's the big difference between B and C, but for, for, for you, not to be overwhelmed, it's important to focus on the difference between think, A and B. Yeah. What we're trying to focus on today, A level, teams are silos, B level, 
teams are learning to work together as a team of teams. And, and remember that we talked about uh, ecosystems. So there's always a lot of boxes you can fill in your organization. And, and, and those boxes tend to strive for status quo. So uh, it, it's, it's not obvious to go across that line and to create those bigger units because it really touches people and, and work that they've been doing for years. Um, there are some examples of companies that we've met that uh, are of the higher archetypes. Ysoft is a very good idea. Pandadoc is a very good example. And you can use the names, names of the companies and search in YouTube and you'll find these people talking and explaining how they work. And there's probably and many, many, many more that we've never met. Probably many more we, we don't know about. Um, another way to explain that is this one group of teams, teams of, uh, teams of teams, right? So um, at the A level, if I have a search item as a stakeholder, I go to the search team, A level. At the B level, I just go to this group of teams and I will let them decide who is doing search. Like in a Scrum team, as a manager, you, you don't micromanage who is working on what within a team. The same way at the B level, you as a stakeholder don't micromanage anymore which team is pulling work. You, you just giving work to a bunch of teams and let them self-organize and learn from each other. And that creates a lot of fluidity, adaptability. Um, but so guys, we have, we have a lot of things to talk to you about. And this is like, this map, this maps of today, is like 10% of our video course. So we're having hard times with Roland figuring out, but let's go to the frameworks. Yeah, let's have a look at some frameworks because, you know, if, if a colleague of mine says, yeah, I've been to this company and they, they are doing uh, Scrum Scrums or they're doing Spotify, yeah, then what exactly is he telling me? I mean, there could be a thousand ways of implementing Spotify. Mm -hmm. It all depends, you know, you know, it's really like, tell me something real. Now, if, if this, colleague of mine would use org topologies and, and map the teams that are working uh, on the and, and to make me really show what the configuration of the ecosystem is, I would have a much better understanding of what he's dealing with in, in comparison to him telling me we're doing Spotify. So what we did is we, we, we tried to map most of the common uh, known uh, frameworks. Um, and uh, the, the reason for this is, well, you know, we try to be agnostic, framework agnostic. Frameworks are good, and frameworks maybe were necessary in the beginning if we were trying to scale agile in a certain way. We needed some help to understand how to do this. And, and the, but these helpers have become a goal by themselves. You know, framework thinking is like, let's hire a consultant who tells us what we need to do to solve our problems. But that's not, it's not working that way. We need to really understand our problems and solve the problems the way they are in our own context. So there's no one size fits all at all. This is what we mean with stop framework thinking and let's make thinking sexy again was one of our slogans. So right. let's, let's enable people to really understand their organizational design and to take ownership of their organizational design instead of renting an idea from an external company. Right, exactly. so we're, we're not against a uh, framework. We actually have some preferred frameworks that we use, but we want companies to see a framework as a mean to an end. Yeah. The, your goal is not to implement a framework, of course. It's never, it, it has never been. The, your goal is to go from one state to another state. And you can pick a framework, of course, not to invent everything. But if that framework along the way, you understand it doesn't help you, you should be able to, to ditch that framework uh, and then go to the, pick the the next one. And of course, the cheaper the, f the frameworks are, the easier it is to ditch them. So don't go with the expensive uh, frameworks. Go with something cheap that you can actually change later on. Oh, you said ditch. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I thought ditch. you said teach first, but you mean ditch. to drop them, to we get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. remove them. Um, on our website, you can find different mappings of different uh, framework that we analyzed. Uh, team topologies, FAST is a growing idea. FAST is about those high level archetypes, uh, stands for fluid, scaled, agile technology. Uh, look it up if you haven't um, read about it. We, of course, looked at a Spotify model 
and we talked to people working at Spotify and coaching at Spotify, and we figured there are two different kinds of Spotify. One being preached, where the whole uh, tribe works in a unity, and there's uh, Spotify being practiced unskillfully by a lot of organization where you go to a tribe and then you go to a squad in a tribe and the squad will have its own backlog, its own backlog owner and doesn't really understand the uh, tribe's roadmap and the tribe mission. So be careful, right? Uh, behind every terminology, there will be some corruption because it's easy to rename things than to change yeah. a real or organization. But with Octopologies, you can just be much more thankful. We are here. We would like to go there. So it's not to you know blackmail people and say, hey, you didn't un understand uh, Spotify. Is to say, hey, okay, your dream was to be here. Your dream was to build a tribe around I don't know a cart products in a bank with ten teams. Great. But but currently, after our assessment, we see that every team has every of this five team has its own backlog and they are their dependencies and blocking dependencies between each other. So this is your journey. If you still believe that dot up there is the goal. So the map is not again to, you know, show people how unskillful they are, but rather to uplift them and give them, you know, remind them of the direction of the change. Uh, we looked at the uh, empowered product teams by Marty Hagen, similar to Spotify, because essentially he learned everything a lot from, from what he's writing from Spotify. We looked into SAFE, of course, and we talked to a lot of SAFE consultants and experts. And if you are actually a SAFE consultant, we are happy to schedule an interview with you. We're still learning. And so far, we have not seen and, and heard of any SAFE adoption, which will be above A level. But it doesn't mean safe is bad. Uh, if your initial state was here, right? And now you are here, there's been a fantastic improvement. So don't get us wrong, not uh, blaming anything. Uh, but, but, but Alexei, Alexei, theoretically, I could, I could imagine that um, if you would have an agile release train that contains a group of A3 teams, right? Uh, then, then that, and they really work on uh, and they collaborate during the sprint after their P PI event and not just coordinate right. during PI. And, and you know, then there would be some kind of common goal that they're trying to achieve. Exactly. So it will depend that on your, be, that could be. it will depend on your implementation, right? So an agile release uh, terrain, a level, like low level agile release train would be, as you said, they get to, to, to they get together for two days in a month. They put all these uh, strings and visualize their dependencies, and then they go back to the cubicles and never talk to each other yeah. and let external people manage those strings and dependencies. A uh, high level agile release train would be they meet regularly and they actually manage those, those dependencies. And now team A, B, and C, they decide maybe to work together as one and, bigger and team. Yeah. Yeah. To actually yeah. um, get rid of those dependencies instead of just agreeing they exist. So safe doesn't stop you from being uh, from building a B level LGL release trains, but it's very very rare that we haven't heard about this yet. But we sure they exist. But prob the prob prob the probability is a lot of agile release trains are you know, where teams are blocked with a lot of dependencies and it's 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 problematic to get something done. We look into fast. Fast is a way um, to actually do B and C level without Scrum. It's more like a flow-based flow -based idea, more a Kanban-friendly idea with open space as a technology to let people volunteer for work. Uh, very interesting developing idea out there. And we are in the era of do-it-yourself frameworks. Uh, Roland, you found this slide. Uh, what is this? I, I created it. I, I was looking at Unfix, Unfix, and I took all the all the elements that Unfix offers 
to create a new organizational design. Wow, a lot of options. It's more than 16 for sure. It's incredible. And and so this 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 gives you a lot of Lego bricks to click together. And yeah. unfortunately, what I've noticed is that there is actually um, some 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 manual missing to really know how to click things together. Ah. So there is a, there's no, to, to, not enough guidance. This would lead organizations to maybe adopt a, a framework like Unfix and not really have a good idea, for instance, on what their optimizing goals are, because an optimizing goal can be a helper to understand which elements are more suitable for you to apply and which ones not. So uh, options, you know, are they a curse or a blessing? Well, w without a good navigation tool, they're, they're probably a curse. So this, this is how I see that org topologies is complementary to the do-it-yourself frameworks like, for instance, Unfix, because they can help you to give direction, to understand like, hey, wait a minute, I want to build a highly adaptive organization and I need to have these team of teams. What kind of elements from Unfix can I use in my organization to create this? Yeah, so it's good to have Lego bricks, but it's also good to know what you're building. Yeah, essential. And I don't think all of us are skillful, like organizational builders or org developers. We're not. I've been doing an MBA, executive MBA, and org design has been barely mentioned there. So it's it's not a common practice to know how to put things to, together. Another do-it-yourself uh, framework is uh, team topologies. Also, you, 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 you can combine things differently, but what are you trying to build? A lot of people these days say, we're doing team topologies. I'm like, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, we do Lego. But what are you building with team topologies or with Unfix? And I think with uh, we're not, again, we're not against team topologies or Unfix, great ideas, but you need to have a direction. And it, it can be anything on the map. It can be anything in your mind, but I think you should be clear on what you're building, what is your vision and then you'll be able to own that vision and pick a framework that suits you right um it doesn't matter how we map frameworks and stuff i think it's important that you take this yeah. tool like our friend david michel did and just map his teams so he collected uh, team representatives and managers into a workshop he, they downloaded the map we put them put it in a mirror or something and they started to map they ask each team, where, 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 where do you think you are? And where do you think your direction is in a, in a couple of years? And he says they had very interesting eye-opening discussions because, first of all, people could not agree where they are. Secondly, they couldn't agree where they're going. And managers uh, had different understanding than teams because managers don't always understand the how things really are. So this tool can help you to create this radical transparency and more clarity on your agile transformation. And uh, that's the only goal of this tool, actually. Mm -hmm. And when, we, when we're happy for you, if you are able to align within a company on, or maybe within a part of a company, right? What is your change? Because essentially everybody's doing agile transformation, but clarity is not always uh, present there. So the method is actually is just four steps. You've, you've seen this before, hopefully, as Agile coaches. Right. You need to envision your target state, your target org design. We would like to be there. And you should have good reasons why you would like to be there. Uh, it gives you more competitive advantage. It gives you more speed. It gives you more quality. I mean, this is internal strategical discussion that needs to happen then you assess where you are and you put different teams in different boxes and we have actually more detailed view on that like uh, you're flying over a, a company and you see different teams working together we actually have another view just don't have time to show it to you now uh, so you assess where you are and then you est establish the next step and you do experiments maybe in some part of an organization you don't need to move all your teams to B-level. Maybe you will play with a couple of teams with fast going to B-level and a couple of teams will do less to go to B-level. 
and other teams will do something else. So it's 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 okay to apply actually multiple frameworks in one company. And we need to add to this as well that this these changes are not overnight. You know, this is a long process of years and years and years and years. And of, you can track your progress. Development, the organization, yeah. And that's why the map can help you to keep track of where you are and what you're trying to achieve and to keep everybody, you know, aligned on the same vision of change that you're you're having over the over the years. Yeah. Um, now, maybe uh, if you want to learn more about this, then we want to invite you to maybe uh, join one of our classes. We teach physical classes. Um, people are invited to bring their current org designs. And besides uh, theoretical parts during the uh, course of two days, uh, we help people to understand their design better, what the vision of the current design is, optimizing goals, you know, organizational capabilities, and then at the end of the two days, they will have developed not only after assessing the current organizational design, they've developed options for new organizational designs and that people, the attendees will present their new org designs as a final piece of work. Right. And uh, we're collecting a list of practices, which is work in progress now, which will help you to go from A to B and B to C, which we're going to teach in another class for consultants. So that there will be a two-day class where we will help the teams to elevate themselves. That's an elevation a metaphor. And we're currently interviewing a lot of companies to grasp those specific practices, how they reduce dependencies, how they collaborate across teams, how they do cross team learning, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna write a book on that. Next. Yeah, so this is this is the answer to the question that we get often, like how do you do it? We understand higher archetypes are a thing to strive for and to want, but how do you do it? Well, this, this is how do you do it? Right. So I'm going to share, um, I'm going to share this mirror board with you here and I will then also share it in a meetup group. So you guys can have longer look at, at everything we shared with, with you. If you like this, if you like our approach, uh, and if the today course is too much, we have a video course, as we say, uh, self-paced, it's about five hours and a half now of material. And this is the video underscore agile underscore Frankfurt underscore 25. Make a screenshot, it will give it 25% over 150 euro price uh, for the video course. And there's some interviews with uh, people of higher archetypes in there, product owner uh, from uh, Ysoft. Right. You know, so it's interesting if you want to know more about the higher archetypes as well. Uh, we're not making this up. There's really people in there talking about it. And if you want to have just free info, information, we have a lot of things on the website. And if you join our Slack, it's a link actually from the mirror board. Uh, there are like uh, 200 people, I guess, talking and sharing ideas.